we see actually a lot of innovations happens at city and even sub-city level, mostly because the bureaucracy is uh, more flat. It's easier to propose some new idea like participatory budgeting. It's easier on a township or city level than it is on a national level. So uh, in this sense, of course, out of those political experiments comes the tools uh, that supports those experiments. It's never the tools that e exist in itself, but people having a political will to willing to try a different governance model. And although uh, you and I are both use the term uh, civil society, I, I would argue that a lot of people who participate in the civil society also has a, a, a dual role as, you know, just professors, academics, and you know, people who want to study, want to further their own understanding of the democracy and the politics movement or cares about the environment. Uh, in, in all in all, what I'm saying is that this collective intelligence is like a bridge that can bridge people with very different concerns of society together. But it's never a complete bridge, nor can technology fill in the complete bridge. But the bridge making is what unifies everybody's efforts in those uh, common spaces. It's not abstract like theories that everybody in different fields care about their own fields. Neither it is all about production like building a pyramid where everybody know exactly what to do and there's a division of labor. It exists somewhere in between and it's this betweenness that uh, brings it together. It really is, is uh, a feeling first. It's the intelligence is mostly emotional intelligence um, because in a lot of those democratic governance issues, what we found is that things that polarize people, that uh, binds people into ideologies, are basically what I describe as virus of the mind that blinds people to each other's feelings. That is to say, uh, we, if we don't even share the same phenomena, it's impossible for us to, to argue intelligently because we, we live in essentially different realities. And a, a lot of those technologies uh, are there just to make other people uh, live in, inside each other's shoes, so to speak, to share or participate into a somewhat common reality so that they can have some common ground and so on. Of course, there are other uh, social media tools as we see in the US presidential election that the same tools, if you tune some parameters, it can be used to diverge instead of converge people's feelings. But what I'm saying is the property of space and it's our work here to, to figure out uh, which parameters to tune to make it a convergent space instead of an infinitely divergent one. There is a place for divergence, but it must always be uh, uh, followed by a, a phase of convergence. Through the internet, uh, a lot of us um, who were there before the World Wide Web uh, was developed uh, re remembered internet as a place uh, where everybody is is peer to peer and there's no new services and everybody is basically part of this decentralized uh, internet but of course after the web appeared uh, we see a lot of <coughs> centralization uh, toward the larger websites toward the ones that show up first in the search results and so on and it has its benefit it makes a new generation of digital natives uh, re-experience the early BBS days, the early AOL days, when all everybody who thinks like you, everybody who cares about the same hashtag and so on, is very easy to find, to discover. And this is good because it means that uh, nobody feels alone and when you want to change the society or so on. You can always find people who feel very similarly. Uh, but uh, of course, lately we also see a over-centralization of these, what people call filter bubbles, which is why the, this new generation of tools are now more reflexive in trying to, again, uh, make the power dissipate a little bit more. It's not completely decentralized, but it's re-decentralized a little bit so that people can see and feel people uh, belonging to the different camps. And this is how uh, the movements scale because it's very easy to find like-minded people to, to do some work and feel very good and move uh, on some direction. But at some point you will uh, encounter people who don't feel differently and how to resolve this tension, how to resolve this dispute uh, is m the main work in many of the projects that's happening here. I, I would say, um, and this is not a, a popular <laughs> stunt. Uh, I, I can, of course, quote the standard literature saying, OK, you must have transparency, uh, accountability, participation, and inclusion, which is like the four uh, fundamental values of massive citizen participation. But uh, personally, I think diversity is uh, even more important. It is like the ground uh, on which those pillars uh, stand. 
because just by saying inclusion or just by saying transparency, it's still starting from one particular governance model or one particular ideology and just saying, okay, now we also want to include people who don't yet know how to use mobile phones or uh, saying that we want to lower the entry barrier to people, but there is still a, a people on the higher ground and there's the people on the lower ground. Uh, and personally, I, I believe uh, to really be massive, we need to build this idea of uh, intersectionality, which is uh, the idea that every one of us is uh, strong in some kinds and uh, weak in some other of our traits. And we use, instead of using our strong suits to try to oppress or convince people, we use the places where we are oppressed or we are weak to, to build empathy with other uh, people in the minority and, and try to build a diversity out of this weak, weak empathy instead of this uh, show of power or contest of power. And this is uh, what I personally believe, uh, but I I'm of, of course understand there's many different other schools of thoughts. Um, it was around 2008 when we had this idea of, of you know, uh, neoliberalism or anything that says, you know, life is just a, a Tetris game where you try to get more money and more power and then uh, you die. It's, it's, a, it's not a funny game anymore after the, the uh, 2008 crash of the global uh, market system. Uh, and, but a afterwards, I think there's this uh, emptiness, this voidness that isn't like neoliberalism is not the um, globalization religion anymore, but we don't have anything else to, to fit its place. So I feel um, a sense of, of seeking, a sense of searching, a sense of uh, trying ever and again, try to find a way for us to live together in a way that puts trust in strangers, trust in uh, our neighbors first. And it's, it's a, a yearning, uh, is how I mostly feel. It's never completely satisfied, but there's this yearning uh, that has been ever going on ever since uh, that year. Yeah, I, I, I'm not living in a dream. Uh, I'm very satisfied with, with the current reality. But I say this knowing that, uh, well, you're all people with very similar values as me, and this is a very safe place, and this is built on a supportive structure and things like that. So uh, it's not a hallucination. It, it exists because it's like a, a oasis. It's a uh, space in which that we all join understanding the free culture values and the other kinds of values here. So I, I would say, of course, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. <laughs> not everywhere in the world uh, it has the same kind of people as Media Lab Prado, and which is again why we're working to not just scale up our uh, technological tools or scale out our deployments, but scaling deeply so that uh, our feelings touch more people and other people's feelings touch us. A hacker is someone who, who immersed uh, themselves very deeply into a system and then see all the flaws, all the problems, all the logical contradictions of a system. Uh, and. Um, of course, a black hat hacker would then use those uh, contradictions to uh, benefit, to exploit, to make some um, exploits. And a white hat hacker would try to find a way to make those contradictions disappear, to patch over it, to fix the system so it works better. But as I uh, like to say, I'm a hacker with no hats. When I see uh, a system with problems, with exploits, with holes, I work on a better system. I, I don't work on the old system. I work on a better system. Sometimes it's just a prototype, sometimes it's just a proof of concept. But I design the new system knowing the flaws of the old system and try to make it work with, not against the old system, so that these flaws isn't uh, as damaging as it is. So it's in a sense a patch, but it's not a patch in the sense of changing the old system. It's the patch in the sense of showing a different possibility. It's demonstration, but it's demonstration not as in protesting, as in demo, as in a demo of, of something that actually works. So um, in the terms of political systems, this means very uh, simply to take some policy issues, to take some controversial issues, and try to find a way to resolve it in ways that will be remembered not only for its results, but of the process of how we get to the results. And the process itself is the product, it's in the commons, it's, it could work regardless of the issues uh, in the future.
there's a lot of more uh, communications, especially after Snowden, uh, of, of lawyers, of uh, civil rights people, of people who specialize in cryptography, in mathematics, and people who specialize in engineering, to, uh, of all kinds, to work together because um, there is this um, existential proof of a, a old system that is uh, causing a lot of people's uh, problems and uh, the old system is, is not gone because it was revealed, right? It has still uh, expands and expands with much better excuses now, especially in Europe. So uh, for people who want to demonstrate something that works better, first there is a concrete shape of the old system with its flaws, with exploits uh, made very clear. It was uh, like what we call tinfoil, right? It exists in people's imaginations, but now its shape is very clear. This is the old system and it's still working like this. And for people who want an alternative system, it is a blessing because then people know exactly how to build a new system that works around or uh, works uh, with this old system without repeating its mistakes. And then it's also uh, a, a pressure because then people really have to work across different disciplines because nobody really knows all the discipline involved uh, in order to make an alternative system. The, the way I, I think of um, Assange's work, um, it, it's, it's very complex because uh, he, himself uh, as a political entity with full agency is one thing and WikiLeaks, which is this infrastructure that he built, not alone, but with a lot of collaborators, uh, is another thing. So it's very difficult for me to, to simplify the, the rhetorics. But what I can say is that uh, people who um, contribute to this kind of transparency uh, works in a way that let us look at their work and say, okay, maybe this should have been handled better, or maybe this uh, has a positive impact. But positive or, or negative, it provides a contrast of what uh, the systems uh, that exist before this kind of decentralized uh, check of power. So it is, I think, part of the check and balance, but we cannot just rely on the check and balance itself. So I would say it's a net positive thing, but I would not say it's all positive. Back when the proprietary software was the norm, um, before Microsoft joined the Linux Foundation, uh, when, when proprietary systems was the norm, uh, there were people who still want access to the source. Uh, and these system hackers, they use reverse engineering, right, to get back the assemblies or the sources of the systems, even though it's not uh, authorized to them. Uh, or people leaked uh, the Microsoft Windows source code in one instance. Uh, what I'm saying is, um, as long as the governance system is, is proprietary, it, 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 if it doesn't have a way to, for people to view source of the policy decisions, there will always be people who are motivated, sometimes for ethical reasons, but sometimes for not so ethical reasons, to reverse engineer and get some raw materials, as you said, or raw sources. But as with the problem of reverse engineering, uh, the intention is lost. Right? Uh, if you reverse engineer a piece of compiled software, you don't see the original comments, you don't see the readmes, you don't see the, the reason why the systems were designed this way. So there could be a lot of name calling, a, a lot of blaming that was actually un unwarranted. But I think, of course, if the policymakers can learn to build a, a audit trail of their policy making and so on, then that, that commented source is of course better than a reverse engineer source. But the reverse engineering happens here as a um, tension, as a way to keep this honest and also to uh, make it much more credible if the policy making system actually publishes its own source. Uh, the, the second uh, the counselor turns on Periscope or some kind of streaming service, it, it changed the, the phenomena of, of the debate of the counselors and they, after that they cannot uh, unsee or unremember that the, the uh, nature of the space has been changed. But before this, uh, no amount of political argument, no amount of convincing, no amount of debate can really bring the phenomena of being seen from live stream uh, to a person's uh, imagination. 
So, so I really think uh, hackathons or this kind of activities or those uh, small political systems experiments are important, but also important is this kind of stand-in demonstration. And I do this all the time in my new role as digital minister uh, to, to s s just prove to people saying, you know, in meetings that I hold, uh, there is a real-time transcript and that everybody can edit the transcript to correct the typographic errors, but also to provide more material. And we publish everything after 10 days, along with the decision making that goes after this. So within those 10 days, there's a tension between wanting to censor oneself uh, for saying something that could be mistaken for the media, but also feels liberating because then the media says, okay, we now have the raw material. The people who are doing the investigative journalism now actually has something that produces more value than people who do sentimental uh, media headlines. Previously, the investigative journalist doesn't have anything to work with. So of course they were drowned uh, by the sentimentalist media. But now we are providing much more detail and much more in advanced material to the investigative journalism. So it also changes the relationship of media and the governance system. So this is what I mean by just demonstrating and changing people's uh, phenomenological experiences. One of my first things, because my post was announced while I'm still traveling in New Zealand and in Europe, one month before that I actually entered the cabinet in October the 1st. So actually I'm, I'm only there for eight weeks now. Um, but during September, it's very interesting, it's a, a liminal period. I'm no longer a, a um, you know, consultant with the Silicon Valley companies, but I'm not yet the minister. So within that month, aside from learning from a lot of professors and a lot of uh, people working on open government, what I did was uh, I refused all the face-to-face -face interviews because, well, I'm abroad, and uh, I asked all the media who sent me questions privately to go to this public space called WiseLike when they can ask any questions, but my response shows up uh, with their questions at the same time. So people don't see like 10 questions waiting for answers. Uh, they only see a frequently asked questions and I can reorder the sequence. And this basically makes it uh, additive, meaning that no media would want to ask any question that other media has asked. So within that month, uh, we collaboratively wrote the agenda of my work. Uh, along with people in the civil society, people in the media, people in the academia. So I, I don't enter with a mission, I don't enter with my own agenda, but I crowdsourced the agenda during that month and I've just been putting into action the agenda that was collected during the month. So <clears throat> the idea is that everybody that I met with and everything that I do, um, everybody who are involved have 10 days to supply additional material or to censor themselves, but I haven't yet actually run into any official who censor themselves. So it's a good sign, right? And because if they censor themselves, the public wouldn't know, but other people in the meeting would know because it will differ from the original draft that they received. So then people would, would know that, okay, so this is something that you will want to say internally, but would not want the outside world to know. So there's a check and balance also within the official system. It's like a, a litmus test. And so far, uh, everybody passed the limits test. Nobody really go back and revise or censor their own speech. Uh, and I think it's a very good sign. And if, but on the other hand, if I had not imposed this 10 day cooling or editing period, and, but instead insisting on you know, uh, live streaming everything, then I will be some kind of a, a counselor or some kind of legislator or a parliament member that want to debate with people. But I'm not, I'm in the administrative arm. So I'm basically in the work of uh, coordinating the ministries so they work better together. And live stream, if not uh, well planned and get everybody's consent and so on and previously, is actually a, a divisive, a divergent tool. It's not a convergent tool. So because my work in the cabinet is a convergent role, uh, I think this is why I chose a, a lag at cooling period. But uh, aside from that, everything I do is transparent, of course. I think uh, as a technologist, um, the public policies um, and technologies always exist in a tension because when any technology comes from civic tech into government tech, it basically codifies a, a kind of space, a kind of automation that is stronger than uh, the law of, of code, the code of law. Because um, 
the, the code of law, which is written jurisdiction, is still interpreted by people when executed, when it's run. And there's a check and balance uh, in, in kind of lawyers and kind of judge system and, and appealing process and things like that. But for things, uh, the law of code, it's more like physical law. There's no appealing process. The people who understand it, like theoretical physicists, are, are fewer. And, and it's largely transparent in the sense that it's behind the scenes. So while it's transparent in the idea that everyone who can read code can read it, actually it's very opaque in the sense that nobody can figure out where its repercussions are unless you do very careful investigative work and a very careful academic work uh, like the, the work that was just presented yesterday of the, the council process uh, that's used here in Madrid. So I think it's, it's important uh, if you want to talk about the problems of te technology, it's not about technology itself, but about the way technologists see the role that technology plays. Uh, because often uh, w when we see a, uh, something and we, all we have is a hammer, then we, we nullify it. <laughs> we, 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 say, we look at this tripod and see that it's just a bunch of nails. <laughs> but it's not really a bunch of nails, it's a reductionist view of reality, but sometimes because the technologies are so promising, like blockchain or, or things like that, it's so promising uh, that people were kind of blind to the other repercussions that it could cause, and so forget to get into a, a real multi-stakeholder debate with people who may or may not yet understand the repercussion of the technology. So I think public policy can help by, again, imposing a cooling off period, a experimentation sandbox, if you will, a safe space for people to explore and understand and try with the technology, but not deploy the technology in a top-down fashion to a, a large population who may or may not understand uh, what it means, even though it's open source. So I, I think this is uh, the, what, as policymakers, I can help my fellow technologists see themselves as assistive role to the society rather than a uh, agenda setting role of the society. The later role, the technocratic role, is actually very dangerous. I, I believe a, a good society is where everybody can uh, work on their own dimension instead of forcing everybody on the same dimension and then some people wins and some people loses. And so uh, seen in this light, uh, I would of course encourage, I would not say advise, uh, people to seek their own dimensions but also uh, look at the projections that their dimensions on other people's dimensions and see if they can maybe share the same uh, vector, <laughs> the same velocity a little bit and then collaborate. But if it doesn't fit, if it's not a fit, if it, there's no projection, uh, then, then of course you don't have to collaborate. And this is really the, the zeitgeist of, of this century. It's because of the horizontal communication. It's so low cost. You don't have to collaborate or cooperate with people who, who doesn't fit. Uh, with, with your ideas of society, and yet the society still works. It works by people pursuing a diversity of goals, of, of ideas, and I think uh, as long as you don't really harm other people's progresses, it's very good to work on your own dimension, but also look uh, to the left and to the right and to the upper and down and other dimensions to find people uh, who share uh, similar projections uh, for a while and then collaborate. That, that's, that would be my encouragement.